Thank you, Cardi. And now, um, pleasure to introduce our final speaker, our second Stefan, um, Stefan Friedrichsdorf, um, who is the medical director in the, de in the Department of Pain Medicine, Palliative Care, and Integrative Medicine at Children's Hospital in Minneapolis. Stefan. Thank you. That time's not correct, but there you go. There you go. <laughs> Let me tell you, folks, there's been a lot of discussion about speaker time. So he's, he's, he wants everything he can get. You got it, Stefan. All right. Thank you so much. This microphone working. Okay. Thank you. 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 All right, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Stefan Friedersdorf. I'm the, um, from Minneapolis and Minnesota. And I'd like to talk about children with serious illnesses. And this is what we are fighting with every uh, minute. So thank you so much for having me um, on board. I have nothing to disclose. And um, so my learning objectives in the next um, 20 minutes is really to talk about the opioid academic. And let's find out, do those adult guidelines, starting with the CDC, has this actually affected or increased suffering of babies, of toddlers, of children, of adolescents in our country? And um, let's look how, it's in, both in the pediatric and in the adult world, we see that this is not really an op opioid epidemic. This is a polypharmacy, illicit drug um, epidemic. Um, and these are the wrong slides. I've just gone back to the... Although I do like it. Yeah. And then we'd like to... Uh, I really... Um, to really that this is a polypharmacy, illicit drug um, epidemic we're having right now. And really staying with our title, what are pediatric challenges and what are pediatric opportunities we can get um, out of this? So how well are children represented in the current discussion? And um, so there are actually 74 million kids, 0 to 17 years in, in our country. So that's 22% of the general population are children. Um, when the CDC guidelines were made, there were actually 0% um, pediatric content, there were 0% pediatric evidence, and there was 0% pediatric specialist among the 80 people who were um, writing this. And today in this work fighting, yeah, we have 20 minutes to talk about this, although that's not true. We are appreciating that there's pediatric. Oh, you got time. Yeah. <laughs> so how are we doing? Yeah. Um, Pain management in this country is abysmal for children. It's an absolute disaster in 2018. We do know it's common, it's under-recognized, and it's under-treated. However, when parents come to us, when children come to us, they, of course, expect the bloody best we can do to take pain away. And they say, it doesn't matter whether I come to Minneapolis or Washington, D.C. or Seattle. I will get state-of-the-art pain management in the hospital and outside. And those, I see a few pediatric colleagues of mine who've worked in the pediatric system for more than 10 minutes know nothing is further from the truth. Kids are suffering every day in our country, in every city, because we're not doing well enough to do this. And um, in fact, adults get much better pain control than children, which is interesting after, I uh, thank you for my two amazing speakers, because they are telling how fantastically well this is going for adults, right? There's nothing, nothing compared to children. Kids with the same underlying condition are receiving far less be better care. In other words, a 17-year-old teenager who uh, may have a burn in a chest tube will get a better pain control than a 17-month-old toddler with a burn in the chest tube who is going to get better pain control than a 17-day-old baby with a burn in a chest tube. So why bother? I mean, this little bit of pain, right? It builds character. I mean, what could possibly go wrong if we're not treating the, the, this pain? Well, turns out, children turn out to be adults with chronic pain, with anxiety and depression, not being able to um, go to college. So it has huge consequences if we don't help children as children before they reach adulthood. 
Um, we do know that if we do something stupid, if we have inadequate analgesia, if a kid is coming to an, an, an emergency room, to the hospital, this kid will require much more analgesia, much more anesthesia, much more man or woman power the second or third time we're seeing it. We are creating those monsters. We're creating those difficult to treat children, adolescents, young adults later on because we are failing them as children. We do know from our babies... My name is Kelly Vi. We do know from babies that on the neonatal intensive care unit that unrelieved pain increases morbidity. Babies are more likely to develop brain, uh, brain bleeds. They're more likely to die because of unrelieved pain. We do know, and those of you I'm showing you know one graphic picture, so if you don't want to see an injured child, this is the time to close your eyes. Now I tell you, children with high will come to our hospital right with an injury or with an acute burn. The more morphine we give them right after the trauma, the far less likely it is that they will develop post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, going into palliative care, I'm a pediatric pain specialist and a pediatric palliative care specialist. More than 115 children are dying every day in our country. That means at the end of our workshop in this, in this hour, four kids will have, will have died. So that's a Boeing 747. A Boeing 747 has 416 seats. So looking at that conservatively right now in our country, there are more than 237,000 families who have a child with a life-limiting condition. That's 470 Boeing 747 over American airspace right now cruising. More than 15,000 children die from life-limiting diseases. So these are progressive neurodegenerative conditions. These are cancers and other conditions. So that's actually 36 Boeing 747. One Boeing 747 crashing every 10 days, just full of children. These are not the siblings. These are not the parents. These are not the grandparents. More than 200 people are affected when a child dies. So this morning, uh, yes, yesterday morning when, when I came here, I was actually um, getting my three kids um, up and ready to school. I have a 10-year-old, and I have an 11-year-old, and a 13-year-old. And I, have, um, I hope they will go to middle school. I, I hope they will go to high school. I hope they become a plumber or a painter or, or uh, to go to college or doing something like this. I hope that my wife and I will die before our children. There are more than 237,000 families right now, in this very second, who do not have this privilege. Where a child may die in a day, in a week, or in a month from now. On average, children with life-limiting diseases have nine distressing symptoms. Nine. Three of them need opioids. Cough, more or less, that's something we can discuss. Breathlessness, dyspnea. There's no other bloody way to treat it in kids in end of life and adults in end of life to give them morphine. Pain. In 2018, the vast majority of children in the United States are dying in high pain. That's a disaster. This is abysmal. That's a shame for our country. Yes, opioids are bad. Yes, they can cause addiction. We are all of this. Yes that can be potentially lethal. But we have no other strong pain medication, equal in potency and effect, which has been developed and is available to reduce pain and suffering. I need opioids every day for children with acute pain, with tissue injury, after surgery, with burns, physical trauma, uh, medical illness, sickle cell crisis, cancer, pancreatitis. So let's talk quickly about this opioid epidemic. Yeah, Charlotte, she's a constant um, um, witness here. I'm really worried about addiction. So when children are in severe pain, it's best just to not give them any opioids. Am I correct? No. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no. No, no. No, no. Huh, interesting. So... 
The opiate crisis has brought lots of media attention. If you walk, watch Fox News, this, yeah, these are the experts you're seeing. You have many experts and pundits and politicians who really offer um, simplistic, blameworthy origins for the problem, right? Clearly, it's, it's us, right? It's, it's the doctors um, who are prescribing opioids. Or it's basically the, the, yeah, the empire, yeah, the deceptive marketing of the opioids. They're just all evil. Or it's the Joint Commission. I mean, the fifth vital sign. I mean, yeah. Or, or it's something, it's basically it's us. I mean, it's like we just can't endure uh, um, discomfort. It's the Americans' fault. And then have very simplistic sound bites, right? Solutions, something like, well, we just have to describe, prescribe less. We heard just from my um, uh, speakers how well this worked, and thank you, Stefan, um, for that. Yeah, or just like those, those bloody mandatory use of prescription drug monitoring programs. Oh, yeah, that's working well. Or something I actually really like was actually, well, can we just use much more integrative non pharmacological modalities? Yeah, that's true. Uh, however, there's like no access, and insurance companies don't pay for that. Um, so the opiate crisis, usually when you go to the media, and we, we saw a movie this morning, it's usually something like we have this healthy, fantastically lovely children who then see some terrible doctor who prescribes them some Vicodin, and then the next thing you see is they die on, um, uh, in a shady part of the city. This happens, right? And this is terrible, and I don't want this, but this is not the story. The vast majority of kids or teenagers, adults who become addicted. This is not how this is working. If we are actually analyzing the opiate epidemic, yeah, we really have a huge problem. The vast majority drive from illicit drugs, as we, uh, from illicit, as we heard this morning, from carfentanil or fentanyl, and this is actually shifting every month. On average, people dying from overdose have six medications in their bloodstream. It's not just opioids. They're benzodiazepines, they're on methamphetamine, they're on cocaine. This is much more. And yes, there's, there, there are, um, in pediatrics, dentists are prescribing the most opioids. Yeah? There's no indication for that. Right? That's terrible. And we have to cut down on those 50 opioid pills being out there for root canal. Yeah? This should not happen. Um, but really, what we heard this morning is, this is that we're dealing with substance use disorder, right? And this is embedded in a complicated matrix in our country of despair and hopelessness in the United States. And of course, we heard this. This clearly correlates with socioeconomic factors such as unemployment, poor education, the availability of illicit street drugs and diverted prescription opioids, and the genetic predisposition to um, substance use disorder. And most and for all, in pediatrics, psychiatric morbidity, anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues which are not treated. There's very scant evidence to support even the existence of an epidemic of deaths due to Sean and me prescribing morphine. How many children have to suffer needlessly from pain to avoid one opioid death? How many children have to suffer needlessly every day from pain to avoid one opioid death? The simple question then is, so if I prescribe morphine to a child with cancer, is this kid more likely to become a drug addict in 20 years or not? And of course, there are lots of data you can look. The far, by far, the biggest study has, has shown in more than 4,000 um, um, high school students following them up that in fact, the appropriate medical view of, of opioid is not, as a not, associated with substance use disorder. There's a subgroup of kids who misuse opioids, and those are more likely to run into trouble. Now, if you look, misuse means if I tell them you are um, supposed to take um, five um, tablets of oxycodone tomorrow, and they take six, that's misuse. Yeah? Or if they take 500, that's misuse. So anything which is different from my prescription is, is basically misuse. Nice study from Detroit actually showing is like they find out like those kids who were misusing opioids, why are they doing this? Well, three out of four, 75%, are misusing this because of poor pain control. So they have poor pain management. They need a pain clinic, but there are no pain clinics. And about 24% of those did it because of mental health issues. Anxiety, depression, ADHD, lots of other issues. And some really, truly um, um, had um, opiate addiction at the time. So... Those adolescents with mental health issues have trouble sleeping, uh, physical pain, they're much more likely to abuse opioids if they get their hands on it. So 
fantastically well despite high opiate overdose rates. In fact, the misuse of opioids is significantly down. Doesn't doesn't seem to be really brought up in the in the media all that much. Oh, that's that's on the NIH. Significantly going down over the last few years. So let's look into the CDC guidelines. They never said this has anything to do with pediatrics. They, in fact, state, okay, guys, listen, this is not for children. This is only for people older than 18 years, yeah? Right in the beginning. So to be absolutely fair. The problem is that, of course, everyone is using this, and we heard this morning, uh, we heard already from, from, from Stefan that um, institution and um, I'm, I'm misusing the CDC guidelines. But the problem is that this quoted, that this adult data done by adult experts Children are suffering of that because of that today. Because we're not part of the story. We're not part of even making those guidelines. Are kids suffering? Right now, this very moment, I have two patients who are suffering. I have one girl, I changed her name, um, Sophia, 11 years. She's currently dying at home with advanced cancer. The best pain treatment um, she had while she was inpatient was actually intranasal fentanyl. That was by far the best and the simplest which working for her. Right now, as of um, September, we have RAMS. I cannot get into an intranasal fentanyl tower. Yeah? I assume she's not, she will be dying today. I'm just um, by email, and my team is out there. And this kind of, yeah. Kids are suffering. I have one patient for over 10 years who is on a whiff of a splash of tramadol, an extremely helpful medication, which that's, um, the FDA has warned against with no scientific background. Three kids died in the last 50 years because of tramadol, which worldwide. That's bad. That's three kids far too many, right? I, but I had more kids dying of IKEA furniture in the upper Midwest in the last year um, th than this. So, yeah, give me any antibiotic which has killed less than three children in the last year worldwide. So clearly, the other was, I have no idea what they're thinking. Clearly, it had nothing to do with, with science. And now I get this, the same letters I, I, I just thought, um, fantastically, uh, well, in PDS as well. Well, you just can do it like monthly or just five tablets. And complete rubbish. And I spent hours of my life yeah, dealing um, with, with those um, um, institutions. So how much opioids then is appropriate in children? Well, we do multimodal analgesia. Multimodal analgesia, like an adult, means we do lots of things at the same time, and together we get much better pain control than just one drug or just one intervention. For acute pain, tissue injury, sickle cell crisis, a major burn, a trauma, yeah, so something's bleeding, a bone is sticking out, there actually opioids are really important as part in addition to adjuvant analgesia or to um, basic analgesia. We need much more um, regional anesthesia, nerve blocks, making sure that we can sort of cut the information coming from the nerve to the brain. Um, that is particularly helpful. Physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychology, CBT, using integrative non-pharmacologic modalities. I'm treated, treated in hypnosis, so I give fentanyl and do hypnosis at the same time. Together, we uh, would do that. In chronic pain, and that's very different than in the adult, um, opiates are contraindicated in pediatrics. So 99% of the kids in chronic pain are, are headaches, migraines, central immediate abdominal pain syndrome, what is called fibromyalgia in adults, um, uh, widespread muscular skeletal pain. Opiates are contraindicated. They do not play a role. I will lead one of the largest pain clinics in the country. Not a single child is on opioids. Yeah, that does not matter. If you have tissue injury, you have um, epidermis below, so your skin is falling off, yes, you will need opiates for years. If you have osteogenesis imperfecta, your bones are breaking, you will need opiates for years. That's a very um, different thing. In chronic pain in pediatrics, like adults, you need PT, physical therapy, occupational therapy, exercise. You need integrative, non-pharmacologic modalities psychology, um, doing cognitive behavioral therapy, and first we get them back to normal life, and then the pain gets better. First they go back to school, then the pain gets better. Yeah. All births in those situations are contraindicated. But Houston, we have got a problem. Fluffy. So we now have all this evidence-based methodology. We know that PT, that psychology and yoga, this is all working. So do health insurance actually cover this? And do kids have access to those modalities in the United States? Well, 
Fluffy seems to be quite convinced here. So, eight million children have missed school in the last 12 months because of chronic pain in the United States. We have eight functioning pediatric pain clinics in the United States. Quickly want to do the math? What the waiting list is? Why? Well, it's not paid for well enough, right? So we're losing, I lose, my institution loses money for every single patient we're seeing. So their waiting list of 5,000 years. So what do they do? Yeah? Most children's hospitals do not even have a designated inpatient pain team. There's usually people who do this as a hobby next to their main job, doing taking a little of cane. Most hospitals do not have an interdescent pain clinic offering physical therapy, psychology, which is important for this metal. Yeah? This large number of kids with anxiety, with depression, where do they go with their mental health issues? There are no psychologists, there are no psychiatrists. And if they are, it's not covered uh, well enough um, and the waiting list are far too long. And what about those kids who really truly are um, in substance use? Like there are no drug treatment programs who accept them, who are actually doing very well. Yeah. So, um, and often if I, um, I spend times of my life basically fighting with insurance companies, yeah, and who for my end in pediatrics use adult guidelines, which makes no sense. Yeah, you have to sort of do this. Well, this, you can't do this in kids, right? If I prescribe um, um, pregabalin because they're not making gabapentin, that's not happening. Yeah, it, um, it will not be approved. Celecoxib for kids um, who will be a COX-2 inhibitor who might be um, um, bleeding, have signal side effects, will not be um, um, uh, approved by many insurance companies. So often profit yeah, comes or just plain stupidity because we're using adult guidelines for those few pediatric kids and there's sort of no data um, uh, run into trouble in seeing those children. And while we're talking here and having this, this rich country problems, 2.5 million children in poor countries die without any analgesia. Because what my colleagues are telling me from Africa is that our pundits here, our um, um, politicians from D.C. go to these international conferences and basically blame opiates for all the evils in the world so kids in Africa don't get the morphine. Kids today, in 2018, are suffering because their adult guidelines, adult experts who made adult recommendations without any consideration to 22% of our population. Withholding evidence-based analgesia to children in pain is not only unethical, but it impairs their healing and has insignificant um, immediate and long-term harm. Of course there are risks. Of course they can, may stop breathing. Of course there's a risk that a child may um, get into substance disorder. But those risks does not justify denying the administration of opioids. Yeah. And like in, in adults, um, suddenly I don't have hydromorphone. Oh, then I don't have methadone. Then I don't have fentanyl. I have to switch this all over. It's absolutely it's ridiculous. It's like, like a, um, uh, a low-income country. Yeah. Are there opportunities? Yes. If there anything good can come out of this, is that now thank you for organizing this. Yeah? Because we have people here from um, insurance companies, from um, state um, boards, from others here. You're here. And the thing is, if we want to make sure that kids and teenagers and youngs are not dying tomorrow because they go to illicit fentanyl or car fentanyl out there because they don't have access anywhere, well, we need to give them access to pain clinics. How many, most states in the United States do not have a functioning pediatric pain clinic. Most states don't even have this. Yeah? So where are they? They need to be started. Yeah. Where are the inpatient pediatric pain service? People do this as a, actually as their main job, and this is a hobby on top of um, um, being in the operating room of the time. Where is the men, are the mental health services for the kids? And where are the drug treatment programs for children? This needs to be offered by healthcare systems, and this needs to be covered by the health insurance. Duh. So, I'm finishing up. I hope I did a good choice uh, person, because I'm the only pediatric person today, to keep your eye on the ball of pediatrics, of 22% of, of our population. All right, ready, set, swing it. There it is. Remember, uh, keep your eye on the ball. Try it again, try it again. Eye on the ball. Swing it. Eye on the ball, yep, go. <laughs> Thank you, Stefan.